You are listening to an American Free Press podcast. Joining me on the line is Sheriff Richard Mack. Sheriff, thanks for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. It's a great day to stand for freedom. Sheriff Mack, I had read recently in the newspaper American Free Press about a convention that was held in Las Vegas, the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association. Before we get into that, for the benefit of the listeners, can you give them a little bit of background about who you are? I want to make this very clear, though, as a disclaimer, our convention had nothing to do with the GSA or the <laughs> the government spending all the taxpayers' money lavishly on some crazy convention in Las Vegas. Ours was our work. It was a shoestring budget, and I completely denounce what the federal government has done to spend the taxpayers' dollars in Las Vegas on their event. Ours was all business, so. Just wanted to make that disclaimer right up. This is just another indication. This is just one time they got caught. But it's just typical of our government. It's not just the Obama administration. It's been there for quite some time. And they don't care about our money. In fact, I found it astonishing that the guy who now is pleading the fifth in this whole thing, how about if I plead the fifth when the IRS comes to audit me? Why can't I plead the fifth? He can plead the fifth, even about answering whether or not there was a budget allowed for this meeting. He pled the fifth. It's just so absurd. But I guarantee you, if I ever get audited, I will plead the fifth just as he did. And what will happen? I don't know. But I have the right to do that. And they cannot use it against you if you do. I was listening to that with my wife. And I said, you know what? If I ever get audited, I'm going to do the same thing. Say, look, you didn't do anything to him. In fact, he got a $9,000 raise. Oh. So, yeah. I, I didn't know about that. That's horrible. Yeah, it's it just, all there. It never ends. It's out of control, it seems. Yeah. The last thing I wanted to talk about, we just kind of brought up, and that's why I'm running for United States Congress out here in Texas in District 21 against a Republican, a liberal Republican who believes in spending and spending and taxing and borrowing and borrowing and taxing and spending. And his name is Lamar Smith. He has voted seven times to raise the debt ceiling since he's been in office in the last 24 years. Most of that happened within the last 10 years that he did that. And he's promised us that he would do it again because it will save the American economy. While he's destroying the economy, he says that he's actually saving it. But that's how stupid things are in Washington. And so I'm running. And you can check that out at SheriffMacForCongress.com. Yeah, actually, I wanted to bring that up a little later on. Right. But go ahead and give the listeners yeah. a little background about who you are. Sheriff, where were you born? I was born in St. Louis, Missouri, 1952. When's your birthday? December 27th. So you pretty much got gypped on Christmas presents. That is correct. <laughs> yeah, my grandma would give me one sock for my birthday and one sock for Christmas. <laughs> I hope that's not true. Yeah, it was once. I was in law enforcement 20 years, started my police career in Provo, Utah with Provo Police Department. And then after about 11 years there, I moved home to Arizona to run for sheriff in Safford, Arizona. That's where I grew up. Where is that exactly in relation to like Tucson and Phoenix and Flagstaff? Well, it's northeast of Tucson, southeast of Phoenix. It's really close to the New Mexico border, only about 45 minutes from New Mexico and about, oh, 100 miles from the Mexican border. It's Graham County, like Graham Crack. And I was elected in 1988. Yes, I was very young at the time. I think I took office when I was about 35 years old. Stayed there eight years. When I was a cop in Utah, I actually attended a seminar called Constitutional Studies for Law Enforcement Officers, and it was taught by Dr. W. Cleon Skousen. And he had actually worked in the FBI with my father, and I knew of this man. I'd never met him in person, but I knew of him. I knew he was a constitutional scholar, so I went to the class. And it was a time in my life and career where I was starting to question what we were really doing in police work and government in general. And I started to do my own comparison with pragmatic government and compared it to the Constitution. While I was going through that process, I went to this seminar and I was completely converted to the Constitution. And I promised myself that I would continue on with my law enforcement career, but that I would adhere to the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, but mostly the Bill of Rights. And so when I ran for sheriff, I ran on a platform based on the Constitution and that we would protect people's rights. And lo and behold, after I was reelected in 92, something started happening in Washington, D.C. that caught my eye a little bit. I remember it was called the Brady Bill. And at no time, though, did anybody tell the truth about what the Brady Bill really was, what it was intended to do. They just said it was a five-day waiting period. And Bill Clinton, I even watched while he signed it into law, and he said one of the funniest things and one of the most Clinton-esque things I've ever heard him say. And he was good at this. I mean, really good. And he was very entertaining. And he said that the Brady Bill would make the streets of America so safe that even our nation's police officers wouldn't need to carry guns anymore. <laughs> Isn't that a good one? That's a good one. Nobody was better at propaganda than he was, but now we've got somebody even better called Barack Obama. Right. 
About two months after Bill Clinton signed the Brady Bill into law, we had a Sheriff's Association meeting in Phoenix, and three agents of the BATF came to the meeting, and they handed each of us, the sheriffs of Arizona, and they did this nationwide, by the way. It wasn't just Arizona. They handed us a document that detailed what we, the sheriffs, had to do to comply with the Brady Bill. Not once was that ever advertised or put on the news. When Bill Clinton signed it into law, he says, oh, good, we can't wait to have our sheriffs get involved in this. No. There was never any mention that we were being dragged dragooned into federal service and that we had to pay for the whole thing. Right. Now, this is a federal gun control scheme signed into law by Congress and the president, actually commandeering our office to make the sheriff work for the federal government in conducting criminal and mental history background checks on every citizen before they are given permission to purchase a handgun. So first and foremost, government has no authority to regulate my right or your right to keep and bear arms. It is a declared right within the Bill of Rights. It is the epitome. It is the zenith of rights. And as Patrick Henry said, we had to have a set of rules that government could never violate. So the Bill of Rights is a list of the untouchables that government can never touch. These are the rules and rights that are untouchable by government. And so now that they're trying to force me to participate in a federal gun control scheme, I said, no way, I'm not going to do it. And I sued the Clinton administration. And I was the first sheriff in American history to sue the federal government and existing president to stop gun control and the overreach into state sovereignty and state's rights. We actually filed this on the 10th Amendment state sovereignty. And we took it all the way to the United States Supreme Court. Six other sheriffs joined the lawsuit with me. Sheriff Prince from Montana and I ended up at the U.S. Supreme Court in December of 1996. I had just lost my third election bid. And then on June 27, 1997, Justice Scalia writing the decision for the majority declared that the Brady Bill was unconstitutional and that the federal government had no authority and, in fact, had exceeded their authority and had no authority to tell the sheriffs to do anything. In fact, this is a quote from the case. We have held, however, that state legislatures are not subject to federal direction, end quote. Well, the whole point with that is, if we are not subject to federal direction, and quite frankly, if the state legislature is not subject to federal direction, then the political subdivisions, likewise, are not subject to federal direction. The counties, the cities, it would be ridiculous to presume and assume that if the state legislature is not subject to federal direction, then, oh, but of course, the city legislature and the county legislature are. No. And Scalia clarified that, too. He actually brought up the term political subdivisions. We're not subject to the federal direction either. Mm -hmm. So the question I have for everyone listening to the program, if indeed, according to the Tenth Amendment, that the states are sovereign, which means the individual is also sovereign, state sovereignty exists to protect the freedom and liberty of the individual. And if we are indeed sovereign and we are indeed free, and if the federal government cannot tell us what to do, just like the case says, if we're not subject to federal direction, then the president of the United States, who's the main executive of the federal government, can't tell us what to do because we're not subject to federal direction. That means the United States Congress cannot tell us what to do because we're not subject to federal direction. If they can't tell us what to do, how did the EPA get the authority to tell us what to do? How did the FDA get the authority to just come into our counties and do spot inspections at farms and ranches and USDA doing the same thing and the IRS doing the same thing and all these other federal agencies who now want you and I to believe that they have the authority to violate the Constitution because their bureaucratic policies and regulations somehow supersede the Bill of Rights. That somehow, miraculously, if not criminally, they have now put their regulations and their policies above our pursuit of happiness. It makes absolutely no sense. It is not true. It is a lie. It is a usurpation of power. It is criminal, tyrannical government at its worst. That's where we are today. And in this wonderful Matt Prince landmark decision, if we were to educate everybody, which is what I'm doing now in my life, if we were to educate everybody about this decision and the power of the Tenth Amendment, Scalia actually gives the solution within his decision because he reinforces the Tenth Amendment. He reinforces the Bill of Rights. He reinforces the Constitution. He doesn't interpret anything along party lines or whichever president appointed him to be a political hack. He in, indeed enforced the Constitution in this decision and said basically and emphatically, really, that the Constitution still is the supreme law of the land and that a healthy balance of power between the states and the federal government will reduce the risk of tyranny and government abuse. 
So how do we maintain the proper role of government? By maintaining a healthy balance of power between the states and the federal government. Let me ask each one of your listeners, do we have that healthy balance of power today? Mm. Well, that's kind of obvious that we don't. Even liberals admit that we do not. Even liberal Republicans admit that we do not. And so how do we get back to our constitutional form of government? How do we take back our constitutional republic? One county at a time, county by county, sheriff by sheriff, state by state. And then that leads us into what I am doing now, and that is the CSPOA, the Constitutional Sheriff Peace Officer Association. Just go to CSPOA.org, and you can see the work that we've been doing that has been absolutely miraculous. It is working. We have sheriffs that are becoming constitutional sheriffs all over this country. We had nine sheriffs from California attend our seminar. How many sheriffs are there in California? 58. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's very significant. It is. And we had only seven from Texas, and Texas has 254 sheriffs. So I was kind of disappointed in Texas, but we're going to really concentrate on increasing those numbers. We are going to have our second convention on Constitution Day in Las Vegas. I'm telling you, we're not playing while we're there. Nobody played. Nobody right. went crazy. But it's the cheapest place to have a convention. It's easy to get in and out of. We have tried to place this next one in Philadelphia, in New Orleans, in in Orlando, St. Louis, Branson. We tried lots of places. Nobody could come even close to the prices of Las Vegas hotels. And we're talking like $39, $49 a night per room. And we're trying to pay for all of that for the sheriffs so that they don't have to take this out of their budgets. We know sheriffs are really strapped. Some of those sheriffs in California are having to cut their budgets and they're fighting off state and federal regulatory agencies every day. And they're barely keeping their heads above water. So we're still raising the money to make this happen. And anybody who would like to donate, just go to CSPOA.org and you can donate right there. Or you can donate at SheriffMac.com and you can get my new book, The Magic of Gun Control. Fantastic Second Amendment book, but also gets into everything that's going wrong in Washington and what we can do about it. Most of my books have everything to do with the solution. In fact, the best solution is in my book, The County Sheriff, America's Last Hope. And that book should be read by everybody in America. This was June 27th, 1997. That's when the decision came out, Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sure you remember that day as clear as a bell. Oh, I do. I can tell you exactly where. Actually, CBS News put me in a hotel room in Tucson because they knew the decision was coming out that day because it was the last day. The very next day, the Supreme Court went on vacation. So they knew that it had to be coming out that day. CBS called me and said, hey, we've got your paid room in Tucson, and we want to interview you as soon as the decision comes out. So that's what happened, and I remember every bit of it. You well, good. Do you think that the Supreme Court came out with a decision right before they were breaking on purpose, or do you think that was just by chance? Yeah. Now, historically, CBS News told me this also, historically, and so did my lawyer, that they saved the most important cases for the last day. Right. I think that will happen with the Obamacare lawsuit, and I think he'll lose just like we won. We won five to four. The states and the sovereignty of the cases uh, involved with this lawsuit against Obama, it'll be the same thing. The, the states will win five to four. Okay. Of course, Scalia is still there. Yeah. That's actually what I was going to ask you. You brought up CBS. Besides CBS, was there a lot of mainstream media coverage? Yeah, there was, but no one said what the case actually detailed. That's where I was really disappointed. In fact, Sheriff Prince and I both were scheduled to be on Meet the Press the following Sunday. And just a day or two, I mean, the tickets had already been purchased. And they canceled us right at the last minute. I was getting ready to leave. I was packing. And they canceled it and gave no reason for it. And I can tell you this right now. I don't believe the press and especially the Clinton administration wanted anyone and the Obama administration now, same thing. They don't want the states, they don't want anybody to see the truth of this case and see that the federal government actually is not our boss. They don't have the authority. Scalia takes us through a historical jurisprudence line of his details of showing how unconstitutional this bill was. And he just follows this building block approach. And it's extremely powerful, historically speaking. He even, in doing so, he talked about how the EPA was ruled to be unconstitutional in the early 1970s. But they have gained more power and they've gained more momentum. They've gained more money and power and all this since then because no one has done anything about it. And everybody thought we had to bow down to the almighty federal government. And all of that is ridiculous. 
And the states have acquiesced because they wanted government grants, actually pretending that the federal government creates money and that this is just all free money and not realizing that we should stop sending money to Washington and we wouldn't have to play that ridiculous bureaucratic game with them. Right. Yeah, that's why I was asking, because ordinarily what happens in situations like this is that the mainstream media moves in lockstep with the wishes of the federal government, and I would have been surprised if there was significant coverage. So did they apologize? Did they say, we'll give you the money back for the tickets? Was there any follow-up? No, no, no. They paid for the tickets. Oh, they, they did? They paid okay. for all of it. Okay. Yeah, they paid for everything. So yeah, I mean, they said they were sorry, sure, you know, but big deal. It was nothing, but it's their choice. It's their show. But it was just an indication of what was to come. <laughs> we got a lot of press while we were doing this lawsuit. I'm not kidding you. It was one of the biggest stories in Arizona. In 1994, they declared this lawsuit that I filed one of the top 10 stories in 1994. And I was on the Phil Donahue show with Sheriff Prince in New York City. That's the first time Sheriff Prince and I ever met was in New York City at the Phil Donahue show. It got lots of press on court TV. I was interviewed and actually debated Sarah Brady on Good Morning America a couple of times and then did literally hundreds of radio shows, did interviews out of Canada, Great Britain, Australia, and even a reporter came in from Tokyo to interview me. And we actually took the reporter out to shoot a gun for the first time in his life at our <laughs> pistol range. And afterwards, he asked me if I was going to arrest him because he thought he was maybe going to be entrapped because he touched a gun. And of course, in Japan, you get 10 years for that. And he was scared to death the whole time. He literally thought after we took him to shoot that we were going to arrest him. That's what he thinks of America, I guess. That's what he thinks of Japan. He thought we were going to do the same thing to him there. You know, I said, hey, we don't do that here, at least not in my county. And you're protected while you're here. And we honor you and what you did. It was a great time. It was a great interview. But again, there was nothing after we won. The only people that did anything was American Free Press and the conservative periodicals. Nobody, I mean nobody else, none of the mainstream quoted anything from the case. And in fact, no one challenged Clinton or Janet Reno when they put out a memo to all the chiefs and sheriffs telling them that this case did nothing. The victory was just a token victory for the NRA. It changed nothing. And everybody should just keep doing what they're doing. Prior to June 27th, 1997, the coverage was like one of those rainstorms in Tucson. Yeah, uh, it really was, because when we came out of the Supreme Court, what you've seen on TV where there's 20 different news agencies and they're shoving mics in front of your face and right. they want to hear from Sheriff Prince and me, Nightline came to my county in Arizona and did a story on it. I could name you off all sorts of people that you would know. Brian Williams interviewed me, and I can't even remember all of them. Paula Zahn. Right. Pat Buchanan had me on Crossfire. It was really phenomenal. I couldn't keep up with all of it, to be quite honest. And then it, after? It, I started looking around. I said, hmm, where'd everybody go? We won. Doesn't everybody know? We won. Why do you think that was, that it went from literally hundreds of reporters knocking down your door to mm -hmm. crickets in the field? Because they could not afford to have this truth put out there. It would have stopped so much of the federal government's bureaucratic nonsense. It would have shut down a lot of the propaganda that the federal government is our boss. And they could not have the states believing that they're not subject to federal direction, which is exactly what the decision says. Right. So what you're saying is that we really don't have an independent mainstream media, an independent press. I hope that doesn't shock or hurt your feelings. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I felt that for a while. But what you're saying is that the federal government pretty much dictates to the mainstream media because there wasn't one significant mainstream media outlet that wanted to cover this decision more in depth after June 27, 1997. Yeah, that's correct. Wow. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's shocking. How did you feel after you realized that no one was going to come knocking and wanting to expose more of what your victory was all about? How did you feel? Did you get depressed? Not really. I dedicated my life to this, but I'd already gotten very used to the press stabbing me in the back on other interviews. They would act like they're mm -hmm. totally on your side, and then they would twist it around and make it look like something else. Right. I had good and bad press along with this, but I certainly learned who the press was and that they were never to be trusted. And so when the lights went out on the case, I simply went on to other things. I moved back to Utah to run for county sheriff there in Utah County. That did not go very well, and it was extremely corrupt. Man, it was really dirty. It was the dirtiest campaign I've ever been a part of. 
Then I started writing books and was doing some consulting work. And then I did about a four and a half year job with the Gun Owners of America. And then I actually got laid off by them in 04. I did a stint on television. Showtime did a TV reality series called The American Candidate. It was all about national politics. The show was actually in the toilet. I was on it and I didn't even like it. It, it was not <laughs> it, it was not well edited. J.R. Cutler was the producer and director and I thought he did a horrible job. But I I think it proved also that people didn't even care about real politics. Why would they care about fake politics? The show hit the toilet. I don't know how it ever made it in the first place, but I was one of about 22,000 people that put in for it. I was one out of 10 that actually was asked to be on the show. Wow. Yeah, it was quite a compliment, but it was basically a waste of time. But I can't say a waste of time personally because all it was was learning how to debate better. You debated the other people and then got voted off the island, and I was the fourth one voted off the island, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be the best thing since Survivor. Showtime wanted to break into the TV reality genre, so they really put a lot into it. But then they backed off at the end and said, I don't think this is going to work. We were supposed to be on billboards in every major city in America all over the country. They never did that. They made some promises that they backed off on entirely. I thought it would really help my career and what I had done, and it didn't. I met some pretty neat people and learned how to debate on TV a lot better. And so for me personally, it was some very good training, but the show stunk. Then I moved home to help my mom with my dad, and I started teaching school again, because right after I left the sheriff's office, I was teaching school a little bit. And then I actually took a job at a car dealership for a friend of mine. And I'm really glad I went there because it was kind of slow here and there, especially when the economy went bad. And that's actually where I wrote the book, The County Sheriff, America's Last Hope. I had time to just sit there and write it on the computer right at my desk at Johnson Motors in Safford, Arizona. That book, it just took me all across the country and I've been on the lecture circuit and on this constitutional sheriff movement ever since and that's really where my heart is. I am running for Congress, but my heart is with the solution of the county sheriff stopping the abuses and tyranny of the federal government. They have the authority, they have the responsibility, they have the duty to do so, and all of this is based on the philosophy of interposition and that's what Jefferson and Madison put in their Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. In those resolutions, they talk about interposition. Nullification and interposition are one and the same, and that's exactly what our sheriffs need to be doing. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you had taken some time to go back home and help your mom with your dad. Are both your folks still living? No, my dad died about a year and a half after we moved back to Arizona, and then my mom died just last year. They were both 89 years old. I'm sorry to hear that. They were great people, my mom especially. I can honestly say what Abraham Lincoln said about his mother. All that I am and all that I ever hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. That's very nice. Did they get to see you taking up the mantle of fighting against a federal government? Oh, yeah, they saw all that. What do they think of that? Politically speaking, they were kind of mainstream Republicans. You know, they voted for Barry Goldwater and voted for Ronald Reagan. They didn't quite understand everything I was doing, but they understood who I was and they totally supported me. Are you married, Jarf? Yeah, my wife and I will be celebrating our 37th wedding anniversary next month. Do you have kids? Yeah, we have five children, eight grandchildren, and number nine on the way next month. Have you visited Wikipedia at all? No, not really, but I've had some people quote it to me. Okay, well, I looked you up on Wikipedia, and it says here, Richard Ivan Mack, a GOP candidate for election to the House of Representatives from Texas's 21st Congressional District, the former sheriff of Graham County, Arizona, and the libertarian candidate for the U.S. Senate from Arizona in 06. Is all that correct? That is correct. Okay, and you're also a member of the Oath Keepers, is that correct? That is correct. I'm on the board of directors. What is the Oath Keepers? It's simply a retired and current military and police officers, sheriffs, even some judges that believe that we should never obey an unconstitutional order or law. And that they're plain and simply, there are certain things that we will not do, no matter what government threatens us with, we simply will not violate the Constitution or the rights of the individual. I think that's exactly what we swore to do when we took our oath of office. But now we're supposed to be considered radical because we actually believe in standing down. Now, in my first district court trial hearing, the judge there, Judge John M. Roll, and you'll remember his name. He was actually the judge that was murdered during the assassination attempt on Congresswoman Giffords back in January 8th of 2011. He was a great man. And in my book, The Magic of Gun Control, there's a chapter dedicated to who he was and to his life and to his memory. He was a great man. 
And also in the book, it quotes his statement during my trial where he said, Mac is thus forced to choose between keeping his oath or obeying the law. Well, you want every public official, especially police and sheriffs, to do the same thing. Analyze the law and make a determination for yourself. We don't have to go to court to determine if we keep our oath of office. I swore an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution. I can't abdicate that or pass that on to somebody else. I owe the fulfillment of my oath to my God and to the people I work for. Once you swear, you're bound. You have to do it. And so first and foremost, we have to know and understand the Constitution, which I've been trying to do ever since I took my first oath. And so once you swear an oath to the Constitution, you're bound, the argument is over, and if somebody comes in here and says, well, we're going to promote gun control, and I say, you'll do that over my dead body, that is a constitutional sheriff. That is an oath keeper. Right. And that's what we want everybody to examine and have the conversation within your own sheriff's office. How do we keep our oath and what do we do to maintain our oath of office? How many members are in the Oath Keepers, would you know? You know, I don't. I know there's tens of thousands. Wow, big. Yeah, it kind of makes sense. I mean, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. I don't see any gray areas in that, but I guess. No. Who are the bad guys in all this, Sheriff? Are there well, bad in, guys? In my book... And I've been criticized by this. I wouldn't be surprised if it was on Wikipedia, but it's on my website and it's in my books that the greatest threat to our God-given constitutional American liberty is our own federal government. Now, I'm going to tell you, I wish that were not true. I wish I didn't have to say such a thing, but I've promised to tell the truth and I've told the truth in my books. And some people have come up to me and got in my face and said, you mean you think the federal government's a greater threat to America than terrorists? And I say, well, when was the last time a terrorist destroyed our Constitution? Right. Our Constitution is being destroyed every day at a very rapid pace now by our president, by our Congress, and by the bureaucracies of Washington, D.C. I don't see terrorists doing it, but I do see politicians and bureaucrats doing it every day. And we've got to stop it. And that is the greatest immediate threat to America because the Constitution is our foundation. And if we allow our foundation to be destroyed, the rest of the American edifice will crumble. Sure. It also says here in 2011 that you announced a lawsuit against the Southern Poverty Law Center for libel, slander, and defamation. Is that true, too? That is absolutely correct. All right. Let's hear about that. Can't wait to hear this. Well, they've lied about me since I did the lawsuit in 1994. And finally, last year, I had it up to my neck with these guys. And I caught them lying about me, intentionally lying about me. And they said that I advocated violence, which I've never done, that I advocated killing federal agents, which I've never done. My father was a federal agent. I have friends who are federal agents, but I do advocate a strong, peaceful stand, and I do advocate arresting federal agents if they come into your county and break the law. What's so bad about that? I believe in upholding the law. I believe in law and order. Just because government officials break the law, they have no license to do that. If they break the law, they should be arrested. If they come into your county and break the law, the sheriff should take action against them. Yes, I've always advocated that. That's called law and order. It's called keeping the peace. So Southern Poverty Law Center did a retraction and a little lame apology. It didn't work. I've got lots of people still since then saying, well, we don't want anything to do with you because you believe in murdering agents and cops. And so I filed a lawsuit and we're still in the middle of it. Where does it stand right now? We're just going back and forth on pretrial motions. Is it in the, what's called the discovery phase? Pretty close, yeah. Great. I mean, I'd really like to hear more about that. It's going to be an amazing case, especially if it gets to trial. If it gets to trial, SPLC will definitely be sorry they ever let it go this far. <laughs> That's a shame because, you know, they're one of my favorites. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's talk about you running for Congress. It happened that the GO people, have you heard of G-O-O-O-H, GO? Absolutely. I interviewed the president and founder of GO. Okay, that's Tim Cox, and he's that's a friend right. of mine. Well, some of his people asked me to come to a meeting, and it was the only weekend I had available. And I said, well, okay, I'll go. Well, it turned out that it was a nomination meeting, mm -hmm. and I won, and that was Saturday. I didn't even know what was going on, and I had, okay, I'll participate, okay. And then they said, well, you got to come back tomorrow, and that's the final. And all the people who won have to get together, and we're doing this all over the state. And I said, okay. I said, I'll go to church, and then I'll be on over. Mm -hmm. Another four-hour deal. I won that, and after going through that process and me realizing that maybe somebody smarter than I came up with this idea, I went home and told my wife, I said, I know you're not going to like this, but I'm running for U.S. Congress. <laughs> and she just kind of gave me this dirty look, and she goes, okay. And I said, I just couldn't tell him no. I just felt like it was something I was supposed to do. And I said, this whole thing was kind of looked kind of inspired because it happened at the only time I'm not somewhere else speaking. Right. 
And she realized that too, and she, I think, gave me a hug or a nod or a wink or something and said, okay, go for it. And so we're going for it, and I don't know why it's supposed to happen, I guess. We're not doing well in the polls, and this guy is so entrenched, and he's such a snake in the grass, Mm -hmm. but we're going against him. In fact, you can look at everything that's unconstitutional, he's voted for. Everything that's been big brother government, he's voted for. Like I said, he's voted for the debt ceiling increase seven times, and he'll do it again. He has completely helped destroy our economy, destroy our country, destroy our constitution, voted for the Patriot Act two or three different times, voted for the NDAA, authored SOPA, believes in big brother government regulating the internet, has completely betrayed big businesses out here in Texas. And, you know, the mainstream Republicans, oh, we've got to keep voting for Lamar Smith. He's been in there 24 years. (laughs) We want him in there longer. I guess they believe if he hasn't got it right yet, he deserves another chance to try to get it right. I don't know. But he really is a typical Washington, D.C. politician. I would say that he's very entrenched as a member of the Washington, D.C. syndicate. Pretty much all of them are, I guess. That's why they're there. Of course. Again, if anybody wants to donate, we really need your help. Just go to Sheriff Mac for Congress.com. Right. If some of the listeners wanted to, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people who are interested in getting you into Congress. I mean, that would be great. You know, that'd be a fantasy for a lot of people. Besides going to Sheriff Mack for Congress and donating, is there anything else that they could do for you? Well, if anybody's out here in Texas, especially, or if you want to come out here and help with the phones and putting your feet on the ground to go door to door, as we're going to do here pretty quick, yeah, you can email us and we'll get you on the list. And wherever you are here in Texas or wherever you are in the country, you want to come out. I don't know where you'd stay, but we'd put you up somewhere. That's great. And I see that your district encompasses, I guess, I don't know if all are parts of San Antonio. Just the northwest part of San Antonio and then goes into a little corner of Austin. That's great. Sheriff Richard Mack, I want to thank you so much for the time you spent today explaining all this to the listeners. You're a great man. You're a great American. And I know I'm hoping and praying that you do get into Congress. Somebody like you is desperately needed as far as I'm concerned. And I'm sure a lot of listeners feel the same way about that. And again, thanks so much for your time. Well, thank you too. Thanks for having me. And thanks to everybody on the program. And like I say, it's a great day to stand for freedom. So let's do it.